<laughs> These dialogues are sponsored by Sustainable Claremont, and uh, Pomona College is very gracious in letting us use this room. Uh, they say that we can do this if they're a partner, so uh, uh, it's, they're great facilities, and I appreciate Eddie G coming down and videotaping these. These uh, presentations are posted on YouTube with a link at the Sustainable Claremont's website. Uh, so if you ever want to go back and refer to it again, it, it's there. And this, this evening, we have Dave Roger again. He was very gracious to agree to give this second uh, dialogue. Last month, he talked on pruning other trees and fruit trees. But there was such a popular demand for a talk on fruit trees that he agreed to do this again. And I've just learned that on Mondays, he gets up he lives out in the desert and gets up at 3.45 in the morning and comes out here. So <laughs> it's incredible that uh, he's able to do this. <laughs> uh, so I think I'll just uh, turn it over to Dave to talk about pruning of fruit trees. And may, thank you, Dave. May, may I make oh, just a few announcements? Yes, this is Kate Irvine, who is our uh, coordinator for Sustainable Claremont. Thank you, Freeman. And I think probably all of you have heard this all before, but uh, there's some handouts up here that uh, let you know how to reach our Sustainability Resource Center, named after Freeman, the C. Freeman Allen Sustainability Resource Center, and it also lists our regular monthly events and um, some of our working groups, um, including the Eco Farm Group, led by the chair of the board of directors who's here, Richard Haskell, and the Claremont Garden Club, and the president, Sue Schenk, is here. and um, yeah, I think that's most of the people from the board here tonight. And um, anyway, the next events coming up next week include the Garden Club Talk. Did you want to say something about it, Sue, or I could just point out it's about February gardening tips and tasks uh, on Wednesday. It's always the second Wednesday of the month at Pilgrim Place uh, at the Napier Building. And Sue's got a great website to keep you up updated because uh, last month it did have to change locations. Oops, excuse me. Uh, so that's next Wednesday from 6.30 to 8.30 and yeah, the refreshments and the door prizes and all that are at 6.30 and then the talk begins at 7. And Yvonne Salvio, um, one of the mas LA County Master Gardeners will be speaking. And let, just one second. So this little flyer is about our green crew. That's our collaboration with the city of Claremont that uh, Dave Roger uh, is quite a leader in, uh, along with our green crew coordinator, Konami Otani. And uh, Konami helps get the volunteers mobilized to go out and talk to the public about taking care of the trees that she and a bunch of volunteers help plant. Um, but certainly Dave and his community services crew provide a lot of leadership and muscle as well. So um, if you could help going door to door to talk to people about watering their trees or uh, could help plant trees, um, or maybe you know just there's smaller tasks around as well to spread some mulch, provide a little water, um, you can contact Konami. Um, and her information is here, but in general, you can just know you can always email info at sustainableclaremont.org to reach us about any of our programs. And in April, you may have heard it's going to be our 10th annual Earth Day, and it's going to be on the same day that Cicla Via is coming to town. Uh, they're going to close a street, mostly, I think, Arrow Highway and Bonita between San Dimas through Laverne and Pomona and on into Claremont for that, say, that Sunday. And uh, so there'll be tens of thousands of people coming to enjoy Claremont, and so we're going to have a fantastic Earth Day for them, an extended farmer's market, and uh, performances and things like that. So this is just our initial flyer letting you know a little bit about that. Uh, it's a little different than other Earth Days. It's on a Sunday and it's going to run from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And if you'd like to be involved, if you have an organization that wants to have a booth, if you want to volunteer, I would love to hear from you. So thank you. Well, good evening again, and thank you for being here. The whole subject of fruit trees is, there's a lot to it, but I'm probably going to focus more on our deciduous trees, which you can see up there what they are versus our subtropicals. 
Um, so let me see. So fruit trees, they kind of divide them up this way. The palm fruits are apples, Asian pears, loquats, pear, and quince. If you think about those and what they're like, then you've got the stone fruits, um, almonds, apricots, cherries, mangoes, nectarines, olives, peaches, pecans, pistachio, plum, and walnut. And then you've got the multiple fruit, like the, the fig and the mulberry. And then one they call pomegranate, I mean berry, which is the pomegranate. And then you get into the citrus as the last group. So I think, you know, when we talk about fruit trees, <clears throat> climate plays a lot in terms of how well they're going to perform, as you know. So we've got the hardiness zones. And if you look at the Sunset Western Garden book, that gives you a good idea what works in Claremont. Um, how much rain are we going to get? How much sunlight? The prevailing winds? And then the exposure, like microclimates, north side of buildings, south, west side slopes, they all have an impact on trees, especially fruit trees. So for example, here you've got frost damage where uh, subtropicals were planted and we got a bad frost. Um, sometimes you can plant the top one on the right, doesn't show, but sometimes you can plant uh, subtropicals against uh, south facing walls and that reflective heat might keep them warmer, keep them from freezing. So I'm going to kind of go over these basics talking about trees. So selection of trees, um, grafting, rootstock, chill, pollination, and pruning. So generally when we talk about selection of trees, um, this time of the year, they're so bare root. If you're looking at fruit or stone fruit trees, uh, it's kind of getting towards the end of the season. A lot of the nurseries are starting to pot them up, but this is actually the best way to purchase and plant a stone fruit tree. <clears throat> because you really, as it says there, you ever really have root issues and um, you don't have any soil that's interfering with the spread of the roots when you plant it <clears throat> versus containerized trees, which you can get all year round, um, but oftentimes they have root issues because they've been in the container too long. And sometimes the soil, the interface between the soil that's in the can versus where it's being planted can <clears throat> um, have a negative impact on the tree. And ball and burlap is the other one, but we don't do that here. <clears throat> so here's bare root fruit trees being delivered. <clears throat> the nurseries take these and you've probably seen it, then they'll heal them in, put them in kind of a moist mulch and keep them that way so that the roots don't dry out. And then when you purchase them, uh, they'll pull it out and it kind of looks like this. So if you can envision these roots, so when you're planting it, you're spreading the roots out and the roots are gonna to continue to grow out. If you think about this time of the year, Nursery is not able to sell it. What do they do? They stick it into a 15 gallon can. So they take those roots that are going out and they cram them down and sometimes around. I mean, I've seen, I've watched them do it. It's very sad, but they'll just cram this whole thing into a 15 gallon container, put some soil in it and sell it. And you end up with a tree that's never really gonna do quite well because the roots have been confined. So I, get, I always encourage, if you're gonna plant uh, stone, stone fruits or deciduous fruit trees, buy them bare root this time of the year and plant them out and you'll get a much better, faster growing tree. And then a lot of, most of the trees are grafted and the reason we want grafted trees is because the rootstock uh, may be more appropriate for the climate that we're in or for the soil could be resistant to pests and diseases. Uh, sometimes it impacts how early they set fruit, uh, can limit the size of the trees. So you know that there's dwarf trees out there and semi-dwarf, and that has to do with the rootstock. Um, longevity, how long the tree lives can depend on the rootstock, and then of course, the ease of propagation. And this just kind of gives you, a, shows you a picture where the rootstock on the right, where that graft bud is. And you all know that when you plant a tree, the grafting bud should be facing north or northeast. 
because you don't want it to sunburn. That's really important when you plant a fruit tree, really any tree, if it's even a deciduous uh, shade tree that is grafted, you want to, you always want to plant it with that bud facing north or northeast. Uh, we do a lot, in, this seems really loud, is that just me? Is it too loud, no? Okay, it is? No, okay, 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 okay. <clears throat> Um, so we plant a lot of grafted trees in Claremont as uh, shade trees because if you've ever been around a ginkgo tree that isn't grafted and you have the horrible smell from that tree, you'd never want to have a ginkgo. So we buy grafted trees like pistachio trees, ginkgos, trees that are actually sterile so that they're not producing uh, seeds or fruit that can be um, kind of negative on property owners. And then the next thing is cold chill, if you're aware of it. So an hour below 45 degrees between the period of when the tree starts dropping its leaves till it starts to bud break, that's called the chill factor, the number of hours cold chill that a tree needs. And in Southern California, or at least here where we're at, that's really important because as you can see, um, if you were to buy a tree that needed 800 to 1,000 cold hours, it would never happen and the tree would never set fruit. There are a lot of varieties now on the market. If you look at the tag, make sure you're getting one or you look in sunset and find out what it is. And there are low chill varieties that need two, 300, maybe 400 hours of cold chill. And generally we can get that in California and the tree is gonna set fruit. But if you've ever bought a tree and you're wondering, well, why aren't I getting fruit on it? it could be a variety that's not getting enough cold in the winter. So that's really important when you're buying one. And then some trees require pollinators and some are self-fertile. Um, so for example, al almond trees, you need to have a fertile, another tree that fertilizes it. Generally, if you, like apple trees, if it's an apple tree that needs a pollinator, you're gonna choose a different, two different varieties of apples so that they can pollinate each other because the trees will have um, male and female flowers on them. And that's another thing that when you're buying the tree, find out, usually the tag on it will say that it, whether it's a self-fertile uh, <clears throat> self tree or whether it needs a pollinator. Always, my, one of my great stories is when I was a student at Cal Poly in Pomona and the professor was talking about the sex life of avocado trees. And it's, it's very interesting. An avocado tree will have male and female flowers. One variety, the, the uh, doesn't matter, let's say one variety, the females will be open during the day and the males are available at night so they don't pollinate. So then you have to get another avocado where it has the opposite. It's, uh, yeah, very interesting. So in cases like that, if, you know, if the, if, if the grower of the avocados has a uh, Haas, um, you know, the growing Haas or Fuertes, then they might put a bacon or, or a, you know, whatever, one of the other ones in the middle of all of the others in order to get that fertilization. And then we'll get into talking about pruning. So the purpose of pruning fruit trees, we want to keep them, the trees if we can, high enough that you can pick the fruit off of them. You don't want them to get so large that you can't get in, get, can't pick the tree, uh, pick the fruit. You need to have some sunlight and airflow through the trees. The sunlight is needed in order to stimulate the buds to stimulate flower and to stimulate fruiting. So if you got a fruit tree that's heavily covered with shade, a lot of leaves on the outside and the sun can't get in, where's the fruit gonna set? It's gonna set on the outer branches. The negative about that is then the branches start sagging as the fruit gets bigger and heavier and you have to take the chance of the branch breaking. So you really ideally wanna try and set as much fruit towards the middle of the tree where the branches are larger and stronger. Um, then to prevent breakage from heavy fruit, um, thinning is two things I think what, they're, what 
what I'm referring to here is one is either thinning by pruning, cutting off branches, or actually then thinning, taking some of the fruit off the tree so that there's not too much on there. And then prune to encourage fruit, and that depends on the particular tree as to what, how you want to encourage a tree to fruit. So when to prune, so dormancy, this time of the year, you want to remove the dead, dying, diseased, suckers, sprouts, erratic growth, anything like that, and bring the tree down to the size that you want it to be. Sometimes you can prune towards the end of the summer. If you've got long branches that are out and there's no longer fruit on the tree, you can bring it down a bit. You don't want to prune it too heavy that the branches could get sunburned, but you can do that. Um, and then any time is just any time. Sometimes they'll just send out an erratic sucker growth and get that off of there because it's just stealing a lot of energy from the tree. And I think I got a picture. No, it's not there yet. So when we talk about a new tree and training a new tree, so what we want is a low, strong, well-spaced scaffold. And yes, we do chop fruit trees. Keep them about eight foot if you want to be able to pick the fruit. Pruning the fruit trees, lateral branches into a scaffold provides support for the tree. And removing some branches opens the tree to sunlight and air circulation. So here's an example of a new tree. And you can see on the left where they're cutting back half of the growth on the, the strong branches. And the ones they consider weak, they may take a third of it off kind of bring it down to a much smaller tree so that the following year you've got a stronger tree with good structure. Again, spacing those branches is important if they're all together like that. And if you were here the last time when I talked about what happens when all the branches come out of the same point, you end up with trees splitting. Fig trees are very prone to splitting um, and they tend to they just tend to have that enclosed bark that I was talking about last time. So be aware if you've got a fig tree of trying to contain it and keep it in. Don't let the branches get out too far and too heavy. And that's a picture of sun scalding. All right, buds, this is the most important part of it, right? So on the left, we've got buds, and that would be a peach or a nectarine. So the two outer ones that are kind of swollen are the flowers, and then the little skinny thing in the middle are actually where the leaves are going to come out. On the right, you've got that would be like an apple or um, a plum, and they have spurs, these little sp small spurs, that, and that's where the fruit comes out on those trees. So it's important to know the difference, because if you have a plum or an apple, and you go in and prune off all the spurs because you see all these little branches, and you think, well, I'll just clean them out of there. You're not going to get any fruit. So again, the uh, buds, you've got flower buds are fat, fuzzy, and plump, and leaf buds, buds are pointed and flat. Flower buds are also formed on spurs of the lateral branches and sometimes are surrounded by leaf buds. So when we're pruning, before I lose this picture, so if you're going to come in and you're going to prune it, you want to cut it like about a quarter of an inch or so above the bud. Otherwise, the bud is going to dry out on you. But you don't want to cut it so high that you end up, remember we talked about it last time, you don't want to end up with a, a piece of the wood that's just going to die because it's not able to close over and heal. And then the spur is a short, fat branch that bears flower buds and fruit. Spurs may form in clusters, such as on apples, <coughs> trees, or along lateral branches, such as on peach trees. Spur life on a peach and apricot tree is relatively short, from one to three years. So what it's saying is, if you've got, <coughs> um, if you know that this particular spur on the tree has already provided fruit for two or three years, the likelihood of it producing fruit the next year is nil or very, <clears throat> anyways, likelihood is not really good. So you would want to cut those off. And then from there, it's going to spur new growth, which will create then a new spur. And you'll have uh, fruit bearing wood the following year. So 
So when we talk about true tree, trees, so we've got trunks, we've got scaffold branches, lateral branches, and spurs. And it's, again, it's good to know what kind of fruit trees you have whether, and what, which kind of spurs so you don't prune off uh, the next year's fruit. So some trees actually bear fruit on the first year on brand new wood, and that would be mulberry and persimmon and figs. So that new wood that's coming out is going to produce um, the fruit, but most trees produce it on the second year's wood. So your peach, nectarines, as you saw in the other picture, secondary wood is kind of a reddish green color. Um, and the spurs are really short on peach and nectarine trees. Fig trees, uh, quince trees are all trees that produce um, fruit on the second year's wood. And then when you start talking about your plums and your apples, they produce for many years on those spru on the spurs, the little short branches that are out there. Oh, what did I do? And I talked about this a bit. So sunlight's really important for flower bud development. So if you don't prune your tree and it all leaves out again, you're going to shade the inside of the tree and the fruit's going to form on the tips of the branches rather than on the inside of the tree. And again, be aware of sun skull. The tree with sun skull will get, can get flathead bores. So, um, I guess if you wait too long to prune it and it's already leafed out and you go in and prune it and you get hot weather, then you take that chance of sun scald on the branches and then the branches start dying back. This is a bad year. It's really been warm. And I mean, I pruned my trees two weeks ago and some of them, the buds were already swelling good size for flowering. It's like, they're like a month early this year. So generally some fruit trees like apples and pears, they kind of have this central leader that comes up. Um, so in order to get the sunlight into a tree where it's got that central leader, you want to thin out the side branches in order to get the sun to get in there to stimulate that bud growth and the flowering versus, and we'll see it in a bit, versus your, your other uh, nectarines and uh, peaches, for example, where we want to create this open, big open vase um, and the sun is going to come then in from the top and stimulate the growth of the buds. Okay, instead of sunlight reaching the fruiting spurs through the center, it comes through the sides of the trees and between the branches. As, as the tree grows, new side branches that are evenly spaced can be developed as additional tiers while others are pruned back. When the tree nears the beginning of its fruiting, trim any upward growing shoots down to a quarter inch stubs, and these will become fruiting spurs the following year. So you oftentimes will see that they'll like espier apples on the side of a wall or side of a fence, that type of thing. Um, it's because that particular species just lends itself because of the, the fruiting spurs are gonna stand up like this and you're able to spread it out because the sun's gonna come in on the side. You know, it's, it's not able to form that, that uh, apical dominant main stem. Uh, so you're opening up in order to let the sun to get in there. Um, but I think apples are one of the biggest ones for espalier. All right, what do we got? Most apple tree varieties are spur bearing depending on the variety the tree may grow fr fruit on the tips of the branches from the previous year or the spurs of the branches. Spur bearing apple trees are best for home growers because of their smaller size. So this is a good one, you know, if, if you notice that the apple tree is producing the apples right at the tip or the end of the branch, the following year, you'll know not to prune that off because that's where it's forming the apples. So if you've got a young tree and you're not sure if it forms them at the end or whether it forms them off of the little spurs, wait and see what happens after it flowers and determine where those are so that the following year you can um, have a better idea how to prune the tree. So 
Spur-bearing apple trees require a different pruning method than tip-bearing apples, so it is important to determine which type you have. Spur-bearing trees can withstand more severe pruning than tip and partial tip bears because pruning these types of trees shorten root tips and reduce fruit yield. This makes spur-bearing trees the best choice to use for espaliers. All right, so spur living um, <clears throat> can last up to 10 years. They're about six inches long, grow from lateral branches, and they bear the fruit. Cutting the spurs off reduces the crop, the current yield, and later years. Trees that bear fruit on long live spurs are ideal for training as espaliers. Once you know which branch branches bear the spurs, you know not to prune these branches off. And then apple, cherry, pears, plums, pomegranates work for this. And there's apple trees in an orchard where they're just kind of, in some ways, espied them out in a V shape. And I just put this in here. There. there are several low chill apple varieties that thrive um, who, in the area. I purchased the Beverly Hills many, many years ago because it was so pretty, the flowers. And then it produced apples. And I was like, wow, what a benefit. So I really like that tree. Uh, but the Beverly Hills and the, the Dorset Golden um, need the Enzheimer for uh, pollination. And that's why I put that one in there. All right, is this thing any different? Second one down, all of these adapt well when the laterals are pruned in a central leader form, but apples and Asian pears can also be trained and to open mature apple, European pear trees need a moderate amount of pruning for best fruit production. Have I, got, have I gone too far with it? Oh, Asian pears, okay. So the Asian pear is an interesting fruit. You know, that's that big round pear sort of thing. They actually are a large tree, 25, 30 feet tall. They're pretty aggressive in terms of growing. But they also tolerate, unlike other pears, they tolerate a lot of hard pruning. So you can prune that one down and you'll still get a lot of fruit off of it. Um, <clears throat> but it, they have low chill requirement, which is great, uh, and it doesn't need a pollinator. So the Asians are pretty, pretty tough tree to plant and be able to, again, butcher it or cut it down, keep it to a size, and it's going to produce fruit. Pardon me? Yeah, and they're resistant. To, I don't know if you're uh, if you're aware of it, but oftentimes um, fruit trees get fire blight, and yeah, then it's a real issue, especially pears. So, as I said a little bit ago, peach and nectarines they produce fruit on one-year-old branches. So the wood that grew last year is going to produce the fruit this year. When you actually look at the tree, you'll see that reddish green uh, branch coming out and you'll see where you cut it the last time. And so you're not gonna know where that new wood is and where to cut it. Because we take peach and nectarine trees down by 50% at least, because you'll see them and they'll send out a long branch like this. And you actually wanna cut it back to having maybe six to eight buds left on the stem and that's about it and then it'll send out a new branch and you're going to get your fruit on those ones that are remaining and they're also a stronger wood uh, the closer to the old cut from the previous year dwarf trees though require less pruning than the big ones um, so if you get a new tree, you want to select three main branches to be your scaffold branches. Those are the permanent ones that you want to keep on the tree. And the last thing I've got is uh, you can thin the fruit so that each one is maybe four to six inches apart. And that gives you um, bigger fruit. All right, so plums, we have two types, the European and the Japanese. Europeans generally need more cold chill than the Japanese. Europeans are more of that firm plum um, or the prune sort of thing, you know, the dark purple ones that are really kind of a hard plum. When you, when you bite into it, it's got that, I don't know, kind of greenish, light greenish color. I don't know, 
if I'm describing it well or not. That's a European <laughs> versus the Japanese, which is a much fatter, fleshier one, like the Santa Rosa, and you bite into it, and you got all this wonderful juice dribbling on your face as you're eating it. Those are the Japanese. So the Japanese are usually more self-fertile, so they don't need another one. And, um, but those, you've got to make sure that you're getting a low cold chill uh, plum. So <clears throat> you want to prune these into a, a vase shape. This one, you're going to leave a few more scaffold branches on versus the peach or the nectarine. Uh, but you're only going to remove about 20%. I say that, but man, I'll tell you what I did two weeks ago. The peach tree, the plum trees were happy last year because I had branches that were probably this big around. And they must have been eight feet tall. At least. I mean, they just went, they doubled the size of the trees. And I just went and just whoosh, whacked them and brought them down. Um, that's one of the things plums like to do is they'll send these branches straight up in the air. Um, oh, I've got it down there. So you want to lower those back down, try and keep your tree more around eight feet. So then this is interesting. So your upright, upright branches are the ones that are going to give you the leaves. They're your vegetative ones, the vigorous ones. They're, that's what's going to feed the fruit. And it's your horizontal ones that generally come out and produce the fruit. So if you kind of keep that in mind, when you're pruning, you kind of need a combination and kind of need a balance on that. Um, and then I don't, I just put a generality. What I do is, is um, I kind of put a half a pound of triple 15. You can use triple 10. There's, you know, whatever is out there. This kind of a fertilizer that's got all of the three main components of fertilizers in it. Um, half a pound per year of growth until you get up to say five or six pounds, depending on the size of the tree. And I spread it around and I, I lightly cultivate it in and then I hope for rain. Because yeah, my fruit trees are on drip irrigation. And so if you're using a granular fertilizer, that's not gonna get into the soil. And if I don't get rain, then I'll, I've gotta go out and put a hand sprinkler on it to kind of get that to soak in. And usually the suggestion is if you want to um, kind of control any sort of uh, fungus, any so what am I trying to say, like mildew, um, rust, uh, peach leaf curl, all different disease issues with, with stone fruit trees, it's always good to spray with a 8% copper a solution of a fungicide and you put, get that on the tree pretty much right after it drops the leaves or at least when you finish pruning it before it leaves out again. And that tends to control that. So when we talk about older trees, um, as the spur system fruit tree age, periodically thin them out to re invigorate the trees. That's what I said before. If you know that, that this spur has already produced fruit for several years and you cut it off, then it will produce a new spur, which will um, give you, which will reinvigorate as it says the tree. You want to keep your suckers removed or you could lose the variety. I don't know if you've seen that, but oftentimes that rootstock will send up suckers coming from the base of it. Try and cut them off as soon as you can, anytime during the growing season because they can, they're more aggressive and they could overtake the actual uh, variety of tree that you have and you eventually no longer have fruit off of that variety. Um, And this kind of gives you an idea where, okay, so we're taking, looking at an older fruit tree. We're really trying to open that tree up to get sunlight in on those branches to spur new growth, new fruiting wood. Things are being awfully quiet. Are there any questions? I should have asked that a while ago. Might go back and back.
So again, you, you know, try and pick it, keep the tree at a height that you want. The semi-dwarfs, if you can get them, are really nice because they're not going to get so big that you, they're out of control. Um, don't be afraid, again, to keep them, keep them cut down. Don't overwater or over-fertilize them. There's a good saying, if you, grow your, if you grow your fruit tree as if it was in a lawn, it's going to put out a lot of growth and leaves but not give you much fruit. So fruit trees, I mean, it depends on, on a lot of those climate things that I had up there first. But oftentimes, if you think about a mature um, citrus tree in the citrus groves, they probably flood irrigate those every four to six weeks. So they really give the trees a good deep soaking. And that's kind of what you want to do is give the trees a good deep soaking. I mean, if it's a young tree that you've just planted and you see that the top two, three, four inches of the soil have dried out, you're going to want to water that tree. If you've had the tree a while, you want to let it dry out down six, eight, eight, 10 inches and then give it a good soaking. Overwatering fruit trees um, is probably one of the biggest negatives for keeping good healthy fruit trees. If you have a citrus tree and you've ever noticed that the fruit tends to split, the tree is being overwatered. So that's, that's a good indication. We good? Yes. I, I don't understand the difference between a branch and a spur. Between a, a branch and a spur? Yeah. I will apologize, but I, I had wood laid out to bring from the trees that I pruned, and then my car decided that it didn't want to. So the, my sedan is in the shop being worked on, and I've got the little two-seater, and I couldn't bring anything. But I'll go back to that picture and try and show you what it is. But the spur is a tiny little, a small branch that comes off usually to the side, and you'll see a lot of kind of bumps on it where, where the buds and the leaves are coming out where the fruit is going to flower versus you saw that reddish green long stem that's very thin, very clean, so to speak. I mean, you could take your hand and just kind of go up it and you'll feel the bump of those bigger um, flower buds. But on the small one, it'll just feel rough to you. I don't know if that... Helps. And that's for citrus as well as? No, 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 not citrus. In fact, citrus trees really don't need any pruning except for maybe taking the dead wood out of the tree or keeping it down to a size that you want it at. But yeah, generally uh, citrus don't need to be pruned. Keep them up off the ground. And if you have a, a question, um, if you raise your hand, I'll bring you the microphones. It records better that way. Okay. Thank you for reminding us. <laughs> so as I was saying before, the open center system of pruning works best for stone fruit trees. Um, peach trees differ from the other stone fruits since buds only appear on the youngest wood. So it's vital to be careful in pruning new growth. And the majority of flower buds can be left on a sweet cherry because the fruit's so small. I haven't had luck with cherries. Has anyone planted them had luck with them? I, I've, I got three cherries. Did you? <laughs> well, you're doing better than mine because both of mine died the second year. And I was like, what did I do? Uh, yeah, I have those visions because I grew up in the Midwest of having, with a cherry tree in the yard. But I've not been successful. So this gives you an idea what peach trees look like. And here they are without leaves. You can kind of see how open they are to get the sun in there. And you can see they whack these trees in the, in the orchards. So yeah, that's what we would call topping. And just a little bit on nuts because um, they are a fruit, but um, there isn't really much to do on, on nut trees. Um, you don't thin the fruit out. You can, prune, you can keep them contained to a size that you want them, but they really don't require much, uh, much pruning. Uh, almond trees have, those, have the spurs on them um, that last for a long time and they keep producing fruit.
I don't know, any questions on nut trees? The only thing I put in is walnut trees. Walnut trees, for some reason, always have lousy structures. So if you look at this on the right, they tend to have the branches all coming out from one point. Um, so if you have a walnut tree and they don't tolerate pruning very well, so it's better to train them when they're young because if you start, if you cut on them when they're older, they're unhappy, they don't heal very well. And then talking about thinning fruit. So apple trees, you know, they come out in bunches. You want to leave two or three per bunch. Um, peaches nectarine, again, every four to six inches. If it's a, uh, what was I going to say? If it's a, an early variety of tree, do I have early down there? Early varieties you might want to leave, um, put the fruit farther apart. You might want to go six, eight, ten inches apart because they need the energy from those leaves in order to produce the fruit quicker and earlier. So there, there's kind of, an, not that I expect anyone or that I would do it, but it gives you an idea when it talks about, you know, having 40 to 75 leaves for fruit, for, per fruit, that's in order for photosynthesis to give enough energy in order for that fruit piece for that fruit to develop. Um, spur type trees don't need as many leaves like your plums, so maybe a 25 to 1 ratio. Any questions on that? One of the things that I learned about thinning is thin the fruit when it's really small because if it gets to be a little bit big, once the seed inside that fruit gets to be its mature size, that fruit's never gonna grow very big. So you gotta get it when, that's, when this inner seed is still young and growing and thin them off. I just go out and start peeling them off the tree. Um, Cause you, I mean, you just get a lot, of, a, lot of, uh, a lot of fruit if you don't thin it. So even though you're pruning heavily, you're still going to get a lot of fruit coming on the tree. And if you want them to be of any size, you want to spread the fruit out so that you get reasonable sized fruit. Any questions on that? Dave, hey, Barry, you know, I mean, I realize this is not pruning, but I'm just thinking uh, in terms of care, how much water is there a of thumb? I have. I found, I found something on the internet for all of you. In fact, I'll pass it out now. I thought it was interesting. Um, if I hold this far enough away, who did it? Uh, UC Cooperative Extension. So it's very interesting. It's a water management guide for temperate fruit trees. So it tells you across the top how much water you need based on how, what, how old the tree is and based on what the climate conditions are. So I saw that and I went, oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> it, gives you an, it gives you an idea. Otherwise, you can follow what I was saying where, you know, you want to let that top of the soil kind of dry out before you give the tree a good soaking. As you know, like any tree, if you don't deeply soak it, those roots are going to stay on the surface and you want them to go down. This kind of gives you a life expectancy of trees. Oftentimes people say, well, why isn't my peach tree performing or doing much? Well, because it's not a real long lived tree. So your peach, your plum, um, apples, Cherries that can be can be short-lived trees. And that's it. What did I miss this time? <laughs> Questions. Yeah. Let, let me bring you a microphone. I was wondering how the Beverly Hills apple tastes and where do you get some of these varieties bare root? Generally, you can get bare root fruit trees at the nurseries. So probably Armstrong's, I would imagine they carry them, although I haven't looked, but I know farther down, what is that, food, Mount Fuji? They usually have bare root trees. You, you'll find them at Lowe's and Home Depot coming in a package 
my experience with them is they're not the varieties that are best for our climate. They are usually are longer. They need more chill. Um, so I, li I think I like going to you know a nursery, and they usually bring them in in December and sell them throughout January, and then they start potting them up. Yeah. Um, yeah, Mount Fuji Nursery. Um, yeah. You know, if you don't find it, I guess my suggestion would be to go to some place like Mount Fuji and say, can you order me one for next year? <laughs> That's what I do. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. Uh, on my uh, Anna and my Beverly Hills, uh, sometimes some of the apples are real sweet and some of them are just kind of tart and greenish but they're they're the same age I mean on the same tree at the same time I was just wondering how what causes I that I don't have an answer for that oh, you um, don't? Oh. could it be how much sun that the tree is getting um, well, they get yeah, I, I, almost all day, uh -huh. all day. Yeah. yeah. And so you think they're getting equal amount of sun, equal amount of water, equal amount of fertilizer? Maybe not equal amount of fertilizer. Would that cause it? Like some well, of them will get nice. I, I don't and have a, a nice and picture sweet. for it, but yeah. you know, you'll you'll have a root for the tree that comes up, and it's actually feeding only part of that tree. And so it depends oh. on where the roots are at. It can be in the same. Not a great, same, uh, not a great visual, bunch. but it can be in the same like three apples. It oh, in the, the same, same group. Yeah, yeah. I don't know anybody have any. I don't have. I don't <laughs> I, have any idea on that one. Yeah, I've had my trees, my Anna, for about thirty years now, and it's it's a dwarf, ultra dwarf. Yeah. And it it does it every year. And sometimes I, well, I can tell years, this 30 is, years is some a long have time more for yellow. an apple. Uh -huh. Could be that it's just getting old and tired. I no, don't it's, know. it's done it ever since I had it. Oh, yeah? yeah? Yeah, I don't know. I was just wondering. Yeah. It's the weirdest thing. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Yes. We have a, a very large orange tree, about 30 feet big 30 feet tall is that tree stand you think? Um, I don't know how it got there or what its origins are but the fruit is horrible tasting I mean no amount of sugar will make good marmalade out of this tree is very bad and so so you know what it is right mm -mm. well I what it's the rootstock it that's it's a, a sour that's the it's a sour orange rootstock most fruit trees are grafted onto a sour orange rootstock so at some point a sucker came off the side of that and it wasn't controlled and the actual variety died off and that took off and that's what you've got yep well now now the so problem I is would that mm, what well okay. well I mean if you, if you want better citrus no no we, we don't we don't care I mean the citrus so it's a big beautiful tree and and the trees neighbors really like its shade I know, but it's so loud I can't hardly handle it. You can't hear me, huh? He has. Okay. See, it it makes that horrible it's, noise. Yeah, so, yeah. okay. It, and so it's about thirty feet, and it produces a lot of fruit that we can't use. And the the tree's neighbors love the tree because it's a beautiful. There, that's better. That it, it's it's a beautiful big shade tree, but the fruit seems to be attracting a lot of roof rats. And now we have this rat problem in the homes that surround the tree. And so, but it's, it's too big of a tree for us to just harvest. And I'm wondering about next, the next time it goes to flower, is there a way, is there something we can spray on the tree so that it won't bear fruit, so that we can just have yeah, it as yeah. a nice shade <clears throat> tree? And yes, there is. Oh, I think it's called floral. Floral. And you, you spray it when the tree flowers and then it, it it, most of the fruit then becomes sterile and falls off. And, and, and for people who are really dislike chemicals to be used on <laughs> anywhere uh, around them, is that like a really bad environmental no, thing? No, no, it isn't. 
floor all is, yeah. is not that bad. I'm pretty sure it has a caution label, which is the, um, the least toxic. Oh, okay. Yeah. Floor all. Somewhere I heard, and it's hard for me to believe, but they said uh, it was a book on pruning. Uh, they said plum trees don't really need to be pruned. Now I would assume that would accept the tall growth that you'd have to cut down. But what that, that's your... generally true. That my my plums, I pruned off everything that was shooting up, and I left all the stuff. They're young trees. They're like four or five years old, so I don't have a lot of inner branches that I'm worrying about shade. But generally, plum tree is very true. You want to get that sucker growth, that fast, upright stuff out of there, but you leave all that inner growth because that, that's where the fruit gets set. Are there any special um, tips and tricks um, that apply to pomegranates? I have a pomegranate tree. I love the fruit, but I, what a pain in the <laughs> rear it is to prune them. I, I prune them um, like an ornamental. I want to give it a nice shape. I take out a lot of the suckers. Mostly that's what I do because they get a lot of that sucker growth. I cut it out and I prune it and make it look like a nice ornamental and it produces tons of fruit and looks good. I. But you did indicate that in the pomegranate they do produce the fruit on the spurs. Right. So you should leave the spurs yes, leave on the, the spurs. lateral branches. Yeah. But get but, rid but of But they, those. like the plums, will tend to shoot up yeah. all these. Yeah. Okay, thanks. How do you spell, spell floral? F-L-O-R-E-L. We just looked it up. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> I think, I, I won't swear by it, but I think the city used to use it on the olive trees before we went chemical free. Yes? Uh, you said that citrus needs, citrus needs very little pruning. Um, does that also include the fact that it does, the branches don't need to be thinned to let in light and air? True. They don't. Right. It does, doesn't need that. Okay, thank you. I mean, it's interesting when you look at the uh, commercial growing of citrus, they just go in like with a big hedge trimmer and they just go right across the top and they go right down the sides and it's all done in order to make the trees easy to pick the fruit. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Do palm, palm granites split because they get too much water or uh, do they just naturally do that? Yeah, I've, I think they I've, naturally do it because mine yeah. is mine. I get some that split and some that don't, and I kind of lenient on water with it. Yeah, I, I'm never quite sure when they're ready to pick. Uh, you know, I don't want to pick them too soon, but I don't want to wait till they split either. So, I don't know if you have any <laughs> clues. No, on I that. don't. I like a lot of fruit. It depends on that particular year and the climate, those kinds of things. I mean, I don't know why this year, if anybody got a blood orange, my blood oranges just did not get much color. Uh, whereas last year it was like really bloody. <laughs> so I, it's interesting how different years, depending on the climate, um, can produce fruit that's slightly different. Any other? Questions. I was just going to add uh, when Richard was asking about um, not using too much water for fruit trees, I've found that uh, they are the one plant in my yard that I can uh, divert my laundry wastewater to because that water won't go through my sprinklers onto my vegetable garden and it won't go through my drip system. But I can have these tubes pretty much just dispensing it onto my fruit trees, and there's little. Um, uh, valves you can turn depending on how much water, water you want to have come out. And of course there's a limit to it, so I can only have about six fruit trees, but it works well. All right, well thank you all for being here. Hopefully it was helpful.